Roland Berger calls him a management uh, consultant. We leave it at that because I believe he is more than just that. And I'm sure we will have an opportunity to talk about it. Mrs. Oshman is the CEO of Merck, which I perceived as a pharmaceutical company when I was young. And now we're living in a different world. So Monica Schnitzel is now working at the economic faculty of the University of Munich and is president of the Association for Social Policies. Superficially said, you might say that this is a big association of the economists in Germany. Of course, it is more than that. I'm Alfred Teschel and teach economic history at the London School of Economics. I must say that we just heard a fantastic presentation about the development strategies of China. And uh, this is the point where I'd like to start this discussion. We heard lots and lots of things which I am very well uh, familiar with in my job. We see economic success when there is success. And of course, we know China's success in particular because, as was explained just now, it has got a lot to do with the things that happen in Germany or in Austria or at the time of the Habsburg monarchy. So the things that were done at the time, the things which were codified at the time, and you will have that in Alexander Gershgrund, who studied in Vienna and then went to the MIT later. So all these things have been synthesized in this respect. I can say that this is a development strategy for the for those lagging behind in terms of economic uh, development. And there are three things which can emerge or which will emerge. Technology. Two, the comparative advantage. So what uh, is it? this uh, country lagging behind is doing best. And three, the role of the state, that is capitalism, which uh, you do not simply leave to the dominant power at the time, the UK at the time. So and this is how we would like to start the discussion. Did Are we lagging behind now? Have we become a country lagging behind in comparison with this enormous uh, and impressive success uh, of uh, this uh, pupil China? These are three components of a question. And the first component might be technology. So you see, here I've got a, a smartphone from a Chinese uh, uh, manufacturing facility. There's a little bit of German technology in there. So my question now is, after uh, China is, is, is you know, now pushing to get to the top of the economic development, what are the things that are left to us? You know, what can we focus on in the future? And the third question, shall we get back to organized capitalism, capitalism of the 19th century where like uh, in Germany and the Habsburg monarchy at the time, played an active role while shaping the development of this process. Do we need some catching up process? How can we do that? What are our conditions? Mr. Berger, maybe you can start wherever you want to start. Right. China is a very impressive story, I must admit. <coughs> In 1983, I was there for the first time. I was working there as a business consultant, and it was a question of building up the machine tool industry in China. This is the basis for industrialization. Today, this tool industry is the largest one in the world. It's due to the size of the market and the growth in the market. It's not the best company in the field. The best ones are still in Germany or Japan, but it won't take long. And you'll see that when it comes to applying electronics, digitization, artificial intelligence, in all of these areas, they will be amongst the top worldwide. China is, of course, an example, an example of some sort of state form. And without a market, you cannot be economically successful. Professor Lee has just told us that in 1978, the market economic reforms from Deng Xiaoping began in China. This is the dramatic change from a more or less unsuccessful economic development in a developing country, and it moved to a, an emerging economy. And it is now the la second largest economy worldwide. And in this phase, 
China understood it quite well to combine state and private forces with a growing share of private forces. And now we're in a situation where we're talking about the era of digitization, and this is the era of innovations where China's plan is to have 10 key technologies and to be the world leaders by 2025 or to be the world leaders. So this will require a huge amount of research and development as well as education campaigns, let me put it that way, for the whole population. So we'll have to see that China has not only a lot of plans, but they're also, when it comes to research and development, to also have state institutions and underlying conditions, as well as state subsidies. So it means that China is now in a position to be this leading economic power in the world. Now, it is really very interesting to observe how when we see an increase in private shares, but also a great deal of state support. You can see more and more in the field of infrastructure and less and less in state-owned enterprises. You can see how active they have been, and I believe that this is the huge change that we've seen since 1978 and all that has changed and that has made China great. Now, of course, you also have to say, and you have to ask the following question, what forms of a state are important for a, an emerging economy? What are the right state forms? I can come up with a couple of emerging companies, South Korea, Singapore, etc. And when you consider the beginning, when they began to emerge from poverty and to turn into an industrialized country, Singapore and South Korea, as far as their GDP is concerned, they are the richest countries worldwide, maybe on a par with the United States or even a bit more. They are did not begin with conventional reforms when it came to shaping their economy. And then they became more and more, well, let me put it this way. They became market economies. And then they became, had more freedom and it was more reliable when it came to a, the question of the rule of law. And the same is what we're seeing in China. If you talk about the future of capitalism, well, we might also be talking about the future of democracy. I think that is maybe uh, putting it in rather strong terms, but I think that is part of the reality that we're living in. in Thank you very much, Mr. Berger. You know, this uh, phone might have a lot of technology from your company. What, I what are the future you know, what is the future outlook for Germany after, you know, China has got so many new things to offer? Yes, we've got the liquid crystal technology, and we developed some of the materials in the chips, the logic, the memory packaging. This was produced by us and developed by us. I would like to pick out three factors very briefly, and I think that these are have an impact on the world economy and capitalism as well. One of them is demography. Mrs. Flick mentioned that we can see a major shift in the world in, 20, in the year 2100. These are sound figures. We'll have 11 billion people. Five billion of them will be Asians. Four billion will be, in, will be Africans. And then a couple, two billion for all of the rest. So the effect of all of this is something that we can see today. Justin Lin is a good friend of mine, and I certainly don't want to contradict him. 
But when you look at the figures, I can also see growth in Africa, faster economic growth than we've ever had there before. So in relative terms, it's slower than what we see in China. But we can see that these are major developments. And secondly, China. We've talked a lot about China already. But the big change in China, in my opinion, and this is especially visible for the last couple of years, and this is that China is driven by innovation. It's focused on research and development, and China is very much in favor of patent protection. And we see a high degree of quality of the research in China. And if you work with China, then you really have to cooperate with them. The Chinese, rightly so, are very, have a lot of self-confidence, and that's right. And another thing is technology. Technology in the digital area, artificial intelligence, IoT, all of these things. But we'll see more and more biotechnology synthetic biotechnology. And when we take all of these factors together, then I think a lot of things can be explained. Immigration, for example, and this is also strongly related to technology, because without a smartphone, many of the refugees wouldn't even be here. They wouldn't arrive. And without the demographic developments, the situation would not be the way it is. Now, for our company, we have benefited from developments in China. About 10% of our sales are in China, but 50% of our growth in the next five years will come from China. So if, as a German or a non-Chinese company, if you want to be successful in China, then you have to be useful. I think the major trend is, I can say that America has taken itself out of its leadership role in the world, and the Western system is imploding right now. And China is taking, will be taking over the leadership. We will have a Chinese century, so to speak. But it is not based on our system of values. It will base, be based on usefulness. And we'll have to think how we want to act. And I certainly don't want to pass any judgment on that. Yeah, the, your association was about was founded about 100 years in order to address social issues in Germany. And you found out it is not sufficient to be productive only when catching up with the best and, you know, do this interventionist policies. No, you also have to deal with social issues. The social issue in Germany is, and I think uh, this is new in this globalized uh, capitalism, what are the challenges we face today? What can we do or say about these new economic issues? Are there any messages which you would like to pass on? Well, I think that is one of our major success factors. In other words, we talk about social cohesion, which we have achieved. And I hope that this will continue to be the case. We can see current developments, and we can see what must not happen. You can't think that trade is cult, or you shouldn't try to look for scapegoats in a world power like the United States to say that they were forced into unfair trade agreements by a developing country, China. Well, you have to think about the understanding and the perception here. Something has gone wrong. I continue to believe that trade is the opportunity to make progress, and China has made use of this in an excellent way. And when will this be seen? And this is when you accept competition. You have to see open trade as competition. And your own companies need to develop further. And if you give that up, if you say the scapegoat, those are the others, we have to protect ourselves, then you've lost. You can't just withdraw and turn into a country for tourism. I think then you can sit back but then you will not play a very big role in the world. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing in the United States right now. That's something we must not do. We can see some similar trends in Europe. If something doesn't run properly, then Brussels is at fault. If something doesn't work well in Bavaria, then Berlin is at fault. Everyone's looking for scapegoats, scapegoats but I think that's the wrong way to go. Up to now, our system has worked very well, and we have to build on that. And this is the state that has taken on its role very well when it comes up with defining the regulatory frameworks. And we also have to adapt this to the necessities. Artificial intelligence, for example, is going to bring us 
brand new challenges and we have to come up with a regulatory framework as well as competition law. This may need to be adjusted as well. And the state is called upon in, to invest in education. I think that is something which in Germany, I can't speak for Austria, but in Germany not enough is happening. The share of GDP which we invest in education is much too low. I think we could see China as a good example. There, the children have better education, and I'm sure that more is invented, invested in other countries as well. So I think the, the state is being called upon here. Uh, we only have uh, a little time to have some more questions, but there's one question I would like to ask. After the United States under uh, uh, President Trump uh, seems to have given up, you know, this uh, role of leadership and uh, obviously read uh, the wrong uh, places in Friedrich Nietzsche, that is, they started to introduce these tariffs and other things. Now, will it go according to the old African motto, if elephants are fighting, then the grass is suffering? Or is it according to an old Chinese uh, slogan that the United States have become a paper tiger? Well, if I take the example with the elephant, I must say that Europe, the EU, or whoever, these resulted as a vision of peace based on the experience we had in the first, in the first and second world wars, and we said that this cannot be our future. We can't continue to fight one another. I think in Europe, what we need is a totally different vision so that the Europeans can be brought back together. And this vision can only be the following. We have to recognize the fact that we are living in a world where we have nearly 8 billion people, and we will only be able to play a role here in Europe. And here we see two rich countries, North America and China, we will only be successful if we recognize the fact that we will be the second or third largest economy worldwide and 500 million inhabitants. Only if we work together and show solidarity and cohesion, if we then try to play a role. And as far as economic, political, Roles, and this should all be based on values that are attractive to the world. I don't know whether we see the grass, at least we are not elephants. The EU is as large as two Chinese provinces. So I think we have to come up with a different strategy. The United States. And we defined it, and at the same time, the United States uh, still have a highly innovative uh, economical system or industry. China is becoming increasingly innovative and will, you know, assume a leading role. Like Roland Berger, I agree with him, you know, being skeptical against any EU institutions, I'm absolutely favoring that we in Europe are working together. Without this, we will do not stand any chance. When it comes to technologies, we have to become more open. Sure, many people have got concerns and anxieties, in particular with a view to artificial um, intelligence and synthetic biologies. We have to continue working along these lines, but we have to define a niche. We cannot uh, simply give up our social cohesion and the successes or the achievements which we have and defend ourselves only if we are competitive and if we increase productivity. And we can do so only by coming up with innovations. Well, I think in Europe, we have to see this as an opportunity. <coughs> in other words, we shouldn't enter into conflicts here. And we, as Europe, need to reinvent ourselves. I see other trends. Everyone's thinking, OK, they have to look after their own country and do the right thing for their own country. But I think 
everything will be right for all of the countries in Europe if we do this together. And I think this is one of the major benefits in Europe. We're very diverse. We have cultural diversity. We have different languages. It's difficult sometimes. It's not always easy to communicate, but we learn different languages, and that's something which uh, sets us apart from the other countries. And we can communicate in different languages. Our children learn this at school, and we should make use of that and turn that into a competitive edge. Yes, uh, I understand that we still have got some time. Yes, thank you. Then I would like to start a third round. Now I would like to come uh, back to what uh, Professor Lin said, i.e. the question whether we can learn from the Chinese experience when it comes to developing new development strategies. Here the question, developing infrastructures, things which we've been, in, which we've been interested uh, in Germany to a great extent. You know, uh, other things are now working very well in China. But if we look at Africa now, and people have different views on their developments there, what are the strategies? What shall we do? Where to go? Shall we give support to the Chinese initiatives? Shall we do something completely different? Have we got any ideas? What are our ideas? Well, that makes good sense, perhaps, to begin with infrastructure. The way we do development aid right now is not good. We send money, which maybe go to the dictators that they put in their own accounts. So that is the minor part that does good work. So our development aid of the last 50 years, it worked for the last 50 years. This was, this, there was no success there. So we have to get industry into these countries so that they can develop themselves. In other words, private investments. But of course, we also have to give developing countries, and this is what Professor Lin said, we need to help them in building up their infrastructure. That's essential. Infrastructure today means maybe something different than it did in the past, but transportation and of course, even we have to consider education, even ahead of transportation. We have digitization, and this has changed our means of communication and the way of educating people has changed. In Africa, for example, there might not be bank subsidiaries. They'll, it'll all work with your smartphone. So the developing countries have an opportunity due to these technological developments and possibilities which we have today, which we can offer to them today, it will be possible for them to develop much more quickly than we ourselves did. And we should help these countries and make it clear to them that they should not begin just to set up rules and then try to build up their economy. A strong state may be important, but as long as the develop or invent the traffic rules before they invent the car, they're never going to invent the car. And I think this is something that we should not pass on as our experience here in Europe. I believe uh, that the development in the world is clearly more positive than we all assume. In Africa, over the last 20 years, we've seen a high uh, increase of living standards, reducing infant mortality of mothers' uh, fatalities, and we see social and cultural progress there. And this surely has to do with the Gates Foundation. It also has to do with many other factors. So. I believe we are wrong in thinking not to invest there. We have to invest there because otherwise we will have a disaster, an immigration a catastrophe. Something which we are thinking about uh, at present is really uh, little of uh, smaller significance. China invested in the infrastructures, you know, 20 years ago, 
same point, uh, same starting point. China is far ahead, you know, little infrastructure, then, uh, you know, poor protection uh, of uh, the intellectual property, so less protection. But, you know, the Indians, on the other hand, they can also build airports in contrast to what we do. Now, what is the conclusion for us? In comparison with the United States, we've got a very good infrastructure. Surely there are problems, but in Germany, I can say we have to invest in infrastructure. In Austria, Trump, uh, you know, announced uh, a big infrastructure initiative and nothing has come of it, you know. Uh, this was supposed to be a big growth factor. Now, we have a problem with the digital infrastructure in Europe and we have got a little problem, you know, with the hostility against uh, technology, which we see, you know, just briefly or recently, uh, the judgment of the European Court of Justice um, about uh, some, some cases. So we have to think about, do we want to have a future? Yes or no. And if we want to have a future, then we have to tackle it actively, you know, doing the things we can do. Well, Professor Lin gave us a lot about development policy. Professor Lin hit the nail right on the head. And sometimes what has done has not worked. You can't really have a great leap. You can't just take a leap. You have to say, OK. You can't just say that's exactly how it's supposed to be in that in a particular country. It has to be adjusted to the development state, the educational state of affairs, as well as the political system. You have to see what can be done best in a given situation. It works best, of course, if you have a state that works well and that you can cooperate with it. I don't know how you can achieve that if you don't have a state. You can't just leave that over to themselves should you exert pressure. Maybe that's important to say that you start at the very bottom and you try to support education so that you will have a population that you can support so that they can emancipate themselves and then take care of getting the proper order in the state. Uh, surely there are differences in Africa. There are, uh, you know, the differences have to do with leadership. So let's look at Rwanda. I can say there is a leader who really knows what uh, is good for his country and this within the time available to him. And of course, not everything is being dealt with in accordance with our uh, idea of democracy. But this is a driving force which uh, brings people together, making people aware that they will be successful only if they work together under whichever leadership. At least it should be a strong leadership and then there will be progress. And I think that this is um, an issue or a question of, 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 of systems in place. And with our democratic uh, experiences or experience with democracy and what we now see in the United States, uh, I think uh, we should give support to the developing countries in terms of democracy, but not only, but also to bring themselves up to an economical level so that people do not come uh, to us as migrants. Thank you very much. I think we've reached a point in our discussion that has been highly developed, and let's try to add some democracy here. Who would like to take the floor? You have the floor. You were the first to ask for the floor. You need to get a microphone. Thank you, Shun. Yes, thank you. Heinzmann, Proctor, and Gamble. I would like to come back to the development in China. I believe that in the first phase, we have had enormous influences flowing from the West to China. Many companies, including my own, sent 
the second best technology over there and not the best one. Now the situation has changed. We now hear that four times as many patents uh, are applied for in China in comparison with the United States. Maybe the quality is different, but nevertheless, you know, if you look at uh, how China starts to honor their own patents, that they want to have them protected, and if you then assume that of the 45, uh, you know, industries where they want to be the leader, and if only if they are successful only in half of them, then you know what the situation will be. Now, what and how can we benefit from the things being developed in China here in Germany and where they've reached the top? Where can we benefit? and without, you know, talking about imitations and uh, maybe some things may not be uh, really telling with our, with our values so that we are not in the second or third rank then. My name is Thomas Matusek. I would like to raise a point that Roland Berger made twice, the question of democracy. We like to live in a liberal democratic society where you can develop your thoughts creatively. And we've always assumed that this is also important for economic success in the long term. But then we see the, the example of China. To what extent do we need to consider our liberal democratic ideas and call them into question if we try to tell other countries how they can best develop economically? Yes, I would like to come back to what Mr. Heinzmann, Procter & Gamble in China. I would like to come back to that. You know, in principle, China is the best example for the benefits uh, you can get from globalization. China, without Western investments, Western capital, without Western know-how, and this uh, refers to technological know-how as well as management know-how and also relating to know-how, uh, you know, uh, that is the knowledge the workforce has, you know. If China hadn't been the, say, the workbench of the world, then China would never have the chance to learn what we have been able to do. And I believe this is the most efficient way of, say, helping the underdeveloped world. We have to use a pragmatic, globalized view, saying, transferring know-how, and, you know, transferring this know-how to the developing world. You know, here, globalization is considered to be some a bit of a bit suspicious, like other technologies as well. Stefan Hiele is my name. Mr. Oshman, you briefly used the term corruption, and especially in Africa. And you will say that one of the major obstacles for economic development is corruption. So my question is, how did China manage it? How did they overcome this problem? Is there a better solution? Well, I do not want to say that China overcome has overcome this problem, but they made progress a lot of headway. I've been working for the UN in Africa, and I had a colleague who said, I would never vote for a non-corrupt politician. And I thought about it. What did he say? What do you mean? And then he answered, somebody is not looking or who is not able to look after one's own family. How can this person do something for me? Now, what do I want to say? If I live in a very stable environment, then I can rely on relationships of my relationships, of my family, of my friends, on, say, those uh, being members of this group of people. And those who continue to develop, or countries who continue to develop, will continue to countries where everything is based on rules. And many societies, you know, they come from this relationship-focused society and move to a rules-based society. And if there is a lot of money and relations, 
and relationships. You know, many of you come from Bavaria. You know, in the past, Bavaria was a bit more Sicilian in the past uh, in comparison uh, to other countries or other lender in Germany. Again, a relationship in historical terms was very important. I do not want to criticize this, you know, using a kind of uh, paternalistic um, perspective. But here in the West, we often have the idea that the biggest problem in China is corruption. Yes, it is a problem, but the party, the state, the companies, and, you know, the civil society existing in China too. They have done a lot in this respect, but this is still a problem. And in my personal opinion, you know, I believe and I compare India and China in this respect. In India, corruption is a problem which is 10 times as big as with us. In the Transparency Index, with regard to corruption, Germany is at the honorable slot. They're in 30th place of about 140 countries that have been ranked on this list. So we rank 30th. So we see that others are ahead of us. So I must say the Bavarian situation has expanded. And I don't want to comment on Austria because I don't know how Austria ranks on that list. But none of us are without mistakes. And indeed, the cultural constraint, in other words, to be responsible for your own surroundings and material developments there, this was the origin of a lot of this and a lot of organizations and also state forms, as well as groups. The formation of groups in Japan, decision-making routes, for example, these are all have their roots there. Well, we have time for one more question, and please um, understand that I didn't call everyone. This is a kind of guided or controlled democracy, i.e., I want to have people, you know, taking part, not sitting in the first three rows. Yes, you over there, you've got the microphone already. Lisa Erzbeck, we've heard a lot about China, a lot about capitalism and the future of capitalism in our international system. The United States, they were characteristic for the international situation with the World Trade Organization, the United Nations. China has also begun with, they set up the Asia Development Bank. The question that we have now is, against the backdrop of the development of China as the second largest economy worldwide. How is this transformation going to proceed if at the same time the hegemonic situation is moving away from the international order? So I would like to know how you see that. Is this a question of the international institutions? Will the Chinese be the ones to dominate the international institutions? Or will there be a new system? And if so, can this be a peaceful transf transformation? Monika Schnitzer is the last, oh, the person to answer this last question. I think uh, Europe has to fill this gap. And there will be life after Trump because his, uh, you know, time in office is limited. But in the meantime, it is a challenge for us. We have to work uh, on this and, you know, close this gap. Thank you very much for your contributions.